Well, I guess I'll start. Good afternoon, everyone. So my name is, <clears throat> pardon me, my name is Jeffrey Harris, better known in the broader preservation world by my nickname of Free. And this is a networking coffee chat conversation that we're going to be having. So I, instead of doing a broad based introduction, we're going to introduce ourselves. So again, I'm Free Harris. I'm an historian and historic preservation consultant based in Hampton, Virginia. And in a past life, I was the first director for diversity at the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Um, it, it's wonderful always to be back and, and to see individuals whom I've known for a while and names that I recognize. Um, and with that, I'm going to move things over to the next in line. Thank you. I guess I'm next. I'm Marta Martinez. I'm, the, I'm an executive director of Rhode Island Latin Arts. So I'm calling in from Rhode Island. And uh, we were having an informal conversation earlier. Uh, I consider myself an accidental preservationist. I work in the cultural world. And so um, part of what I you know, bring to the table is the, the uh, respect and the acceptance of cultural preservation as an important way to look at preservation. And pass it on to Melissa. Thank you, Marta. I'm Melissa Jest. I am the Senior Manager of Preservation Projects for the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund at the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Uh, I was sharing earlier that I'm about 20 years in uh, to this movement, uh, starting in my hometown of Savannah, Georgia, uh, working with grassroots colleagues, um, practitioners, as well as elected officials to bring the message of preservation as a tool uh, of uplift uh, and value building and celebration. So glad to be here with you. So I think it's my job now to kind of transition us into the first discussion um, of our one of our kind of talking points today, which is around the, the term of allyship. Um, we're in a very, very um, curious time as a society here. And this particular term has been kind of thrown around as folks try to position themselves and figure out, you know, you know, how do we bring about the change that, you know, we say we want uh, in our society, the improvement. Um, uh, towards social equity and social justice that we want. And so the term is allyship. And so I'm going to be the, the busybody and, and ask the question, what does that mean? Uh, and it's not as if I can't Google, right, or go to Webster, but in my mind, when I think of allyship, I think of someone or some entity that sees itself or him or herself or themselves outside of an effort, but wanting to bring some, I guess, some help or some positivity there. But I would love to hear, you know, what my colleagues have to say about this term that's all the buzz now. What does it, what does it mean to you all? Marta, if you'd like to start. Yeah, allyship for me is, um, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's trying to, I sometimes find that it's a way for others to, to make up for their shortcomings at, at times, you know, trying to work with with um, people of color, for example, like in, in my place for um, not even sure why they're reaching out. They're really fulfilling um, a mandate or a requirement within their institutions that they want to be allies. Um, and you know, not really sure. And, and I find many institutions and individuals who reach out to me because they have to feel feel like they almost have to check, put that check mark on there. And I see it uh, the other way around. I, I reach out to people who are like myself, um, where we can lock arms and work together as allies to, to, to make change together, because uh, we can't do things alone. Um, and also to lock arms with, with those I'm sorry, Marta, you're muted accidentally. Okay. Um, yeah, so so it, uh, not just locking arms with the people who are like us as, as people of color, but also uh, those who reach out to us who are better, also trying to understand and work with us so that we can all work together. But it is, uh, it's an uphill battle. I find that it's, it's, it's 
I'm always going up the stairs and kind of sliding back down, not really quite knowing where I'm going or why I'm going there or why I'm pull being pulled up. And I think for for me, the term is is one that's a bit on the complicated side, or at least it's it's nuanced, so that one can be an ally uh, as a professional, you know, in terms of a community that has reached out to us seeking help and they need an ally to achieve an end. Uh, there's also the idea of you know being involved in in say a project that is in a community that is not that is not mine, for example, and you know me wanting to show a sense of solidarity with others, but also bringing the skill set that I have and 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 bringing or putting that on offer for uh, the possibility of someone to take advantage of if they so if they so chose to do so. So. For me, it's it, it's it's always been a, a both and rather than an either or construct. Um, you know, insider outsider. I think we all can occupy um, those spaces depending on the work that it is that we're doing and the position that we find ourselves in vis-a-vis -vis our projects. Okay, I think I think that's fair. Um, I, given the position that you're in, sometimes you're an insider, sometimes you're an ally or someone who's trying to bring support resources, you know, to an effort. Um, but I like the imagery um, from what Marta shared about locking arms. And so, you know, as a movement, I think preservation um, definitely needs to, to focus more on solidarity and not necessarily in this, the positionality of allyship. Um, and so being our accidental preservationist, Marta, um, what is, has been some of your opportunities or experiences locking arms, you know, with your colleagues, you know, here in the preservation movement? Um, most of my experience has actually been in, you know, in the arts community because I, I've spent a lot of time uh, just explaining why I consider the arts as an important um, tool or an, a, a, the art, how I approach preservation through the arts. Uh, most of the artists uh, just look at their, their trade. You know, they're, they're a singer, a dancer, or a cultural dancer, and they really don't understand that they're also preserving their culture. Um, it's a way of you learn how to do a, a, a bomba en plena from Puerto Rico or your um well, today. you're yeah, you're teaching to, to do traditional to dances in um to you know whatever it is that you bring to the table it's it's a way of preserving culture and so kind of locking arms with my fellow uh you know preserve uh artists and cultural organizations to understand that that's a cultural movement you know they are in the cultural world and that's kind of why that was the light bulb that came on for me when I first went to the my, when I went to my first National Trust conference, I was invited by someone who insisted I come, and I I thought it would be and it was because I do oral so I'm, I'm an oral historian as well, um, so collecting stories you know is a way of preserving culture. You pre preserve your language, you know. I collect them in Spanish. You preserve everything else. So I entered that way, but then all of a sudden I realized that the arts is a way doing art is a way of preserving your culture. So, so being, you know, locking arms with my fellow cultural, preserve, preserve, cultural artists and cultural organizations, but also bringing that to the table in the preservation world, you know, pr preservation professionals. Wonderful. I love that art as expression, you know, uh, just expressing your experience and, and there's artistry in history in, preserving history in the places and spaces where it happened. So I definitely agree that it, we, that expression, that opportunity is, is what we need to explore. I think when we're talking about engaging folks as well, you know, here's a chance for you to tell your story, to help preserve your history by sharing your story. Uh, and, and to, free, to your, yeah. yeah. And to respect also to respect the culture. It's not just getting up on a stage and, you know, dancing around. There's a reason why, there's a story behind the dances. There's a story, so it's a way of preserving 
you're telling a story through the art. So it's it's respecting that, that it's not just calling, uh, you know, what well, I get many calls from, from organizations just wanting to, to bring fun and, and dance, but there's a way to respect the culture and respect the art. Well, I agree. And, mm -hmm. and, and I would add, you know, as, as one who's trained in academic history, uh, before I showed up at, at the National Trust as an intern 20 years ago this year, what became relevant in my mind was the sense of sometimes feeling as though those of us who are within the broader preservation movement or enterprise can sometimes forget that it's the history that's brought us all here in the first place. And whether that's the history of, from the artistic perspective, history from the classic, you know, book learning perspective, it's the history that has driven, that drives all it is that we do. And for us to then, you know, going back to this term of being better allies and showing a sense of respect, it's actually also, I believe, having a sense of respect for the history, for the historical information that's being presented, that's put in front of us, you know, and, and really being able to properly contextualize it, you know, to really embrace it and understand what it is that that we're engaged with. And when we don't know what's happening, being willing and open enough to ask to ask somebody what's going on and, you know, what is it? what is it that I can do better that I can learn more, you know, more effectively what it is that we're doing so that as we're saying, we're going to help you preserve X, you know, a particular site, you know, we also need to understand the culture that that site, you know, sits within. We also need to understand the community that that culture has, you know, created, you know, do, does, does that make sense? So that for us to be better allies and in some ways better professionals in all that we do, it is, it, to me, it goes back to having that respect for the history, respect for the culture of the various work that, you know, within the various works that we do. And that taps, that, that taps back to the point that Marta was making about, you know, some allies, um, you know, think, well, I got to check a box or, right. you know, I'm feeling nudged by a little, you know, guilt or, or that kind of thing. And just wanting to kind of get through it and, you know, not really taking the time to listen, not really taking the time to develop that respect, or more importantly, that level of understanding so that you can move towards solidarity, move from the allied or outsider position into the movement, into the effort through understanding, through respect, through compassion. Uh, and at kind of to your point, Marta, not necessarily see it as something you have to do, but sit with that discomfort in order to develop that compassion that's necessary to get to solidarity. What's your observations been, you know, when dealing with folks who, you know, just want to come in, get it done so they can say they did it and, and, and feel better about themselves? Other than knowing that that's exactly how they feel, <laughs> that they just want to come in and get it done. Other than that. Yeah. 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 And that's 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 the, the uncomfortable part about it is that sometimes we just have to sit sit with it, you know, literally, you know. Um, so who who are you saying is uncomfortable? Those who come with it or, or those of us who are being asked to join? I find myself being uncomfortable when I'm put in those positions because you know, I'm to the point where I, I it, it just it wears me out, you know, when I, I get so many calls and so many people reach out and and I and I feel like it's not so much a responsibility, but I just feel like yes, they they um, I should do this, but it, it's it happens too often, and and I I get worn out. So there's that uncomfortable feeling that I have is like okay, all right, yeah, I guess I should yeah. do this. Well, as, as a preservationist, twenty years in and and coming into situations where I am viewed as the outsider by others you know, where I am viewed as the ally who's coming to bring resources or bring information, you know, to, to you know, help those, those neighbors who are facing a challenge. Um, you know, oftentimes I haven't had the luxury to be able to sit um, with, you know, yeah. our friends and neighbors uh, who are working on the ground. Oftentimes in preservation, 
you, you're there at the last minute. You, you got to save a building. You, you got to, you know, document a history before it's lost. And we don't have that, uh, that luxury of time to sit and be able to hear uh, and listen and give voice or loud audience, I should say, for our, our neighbors, our friends, our colleagues, you know, um, who are really close to the history, who've experienced the history, who embody the history to express their experiences. Um, we really don't have that luxury. And I think it's really, really necessary. Um, and so it's great to be able to facilitate and to bring about those discussions. That's why I'm so, so proud and honored to be a part of the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund, because it's not just about getting out the resources, getting out the technical assistance, but it's also about facilitating those discussions about why this history is important how Black history is American history and contributes in, in all the warts and, and, and things that come with that. Uh, so I'm really, you know, open to more and more opportunities to, to sit in that discomfort, give that some time so that we can grow and go through it to the other side, if, if that makes sense. I know I might be going on a bit here, but yeah. yeah. And, and I think that that almost like we were also talking about what is it, what, how do we as uh, work with the communities, you know, how do we bring the communities together? And I find that um, as a community based organization, it's my responsibility to try to rally the troops again, lock arms with uh, the people I work with or those people who are, you know, individuals in the, again, in the arts world, in the cultural arts world who really don't understand and, and just work hard to empower them and to un and to really get them to to have a, a light bulb moment and and realize that what they're doing is you know they're preserving not not only a culture but I, I, i'm going to go back to a comment about um we're always talking about saving buildings and forgetting that those buildings have stories behind them and mm -hmm. that those buildings um and the stories are are really what build a community that's what what gives it its history if you don't listen to this the stories mm -hmm. before it's demolished, after it's demolished, it, a community, um, mm -hmm. sometimes I find that a community, you know, kind of fades, it fades away. What was once there is gone and, and you forget that what, what that building, the significance of that building, what it meant to someone, um, if it was a grocery store um and it happened to be the only place that you can find a particular food when you first moved here whether you moved from the south and you were looking for some you know southern food or or if you mo mo moved from another country it was a very important thing for you to walk in and find it on the shelf um and those are the kind of stories i like to collect is it because it it keeps the buildings alive that are long gone even though you can't find physical evidence, which, which I have a hard time finding sometimes. Let's it's, turn it down. They demolish uh, uh, neighborhoods or, or sections of neighborhoods and people just kind of move on. You, you forget the lives that were lived there, the, the lives. So a lot of what I do is work in the neighborhoods and to try to get people in the present to really, you know, collect story, collect, uh, re collect not just stories, but uh, objects and artifacts. Um, that we can bring to you know allies in the professional world and to help them um understand this the story why the, the that particular area is so important to a, a community um so that's part of the the work i do with in building community networks and and that i i love what you said there marta because it it always serves as a reminder to me to remind others that yes you know we often deal with uh, physical structures but just because something is no longer there doesn't mean that the history has disappeared there are still people who are you know who know that what happened in said place there are still people who remember and you know that goes back to my original point about the idea of remembering that it's the history that brought us here in the first place so that I think there are too many instances, at least that I've seen, where within our profession, we get so wedded 
to the physic to the physical structure mm. and not just and, and not the history but you know just sort of can't you know how can we figure out a way so that you know it can be viable after we've restored it you know what are the things that we can do can we get the credits here you, know, you start thinking of all of the of the pieces that one thinks about that isn't directly tied to the history of us of a place hmm. that you know you you lose in my mind why you were there in the first place why somebody has invited you into a community in the first place and you know again more importantly if you're talking about spaces like so many of us uh who deal with you know with uh communities of color or lgbtqia plus communities you are talking about spaces you're talking about places that no longer are there you know i'll use the lgbtq example a lot of those spaces are in uh in in neighborhoods that you know were already on the margins because that was a, a particularly marginalized community so next thing you know you hear about the redevelopment coming through and i'll, I'll give an example we all have lived in or have dealt with washington dc the entire sort of red light district of DC's LGBTQ community around where the baseball stadium is, the National Baseball Stadium, that's gone. There's there was a whole huge history tied to the LGBTQ community of DC that was there that is that is still relevant. None of that stuff, none of that history is gone. The buildings are gone, but the history is still there. People can still talk about. I, I have heard stories about things that you know have gone on. You know, I can recall my own you know stories of going to tracks, you know, or you know, see you know, hanging out and and you know, meeting people. But I think we we do tend to forget that just because a building is not there, that the history hasn't left or just because a building is there, that it isn't just about the economic aspects of the preservation effort that makes it relevant. You know, we, we tend to forget that. And I think that as we, you know, continue talking about this idea of allyship, you know, we're coming into a place, you know, and talking about we can preserve this, we can get that, we can get you, you know, this sort of, you know, tax credit here. Remember who it is we're dealing with, who we're talking to, why are we why are we in, you know, why are you, why have you asked us to come in? You know, the idea is to, you know, we need to give respect for where we are, you know, always, for me, that's always my thought. I need to respect where I am and I need to respect those who have been kind enough to ask me to come in, you know. There's a wonderful um, manifesto uh, that was composed by Black Space, a collaborative of, of um, African American architects, um, and and I think they have uh, several chapters in different cities, but they started in New York. And one of the uh, principles in their manifesto says to plan at the speed of trust. So you have to develop the trust. You have to develop the respect. You have to recognize the in, embodied value of the people in that community. They are the resource they have the value, human capital, human resource, uh, and take the time to um, tap that value. But you have to have trust in order to do that. So I think that's a good point in that erasure may be happening, you know, as far as the buildings, but as long as you have the people, the value, the history, the, the, the power is still there. And so that's why I always refer to historic preservation as a movement, um, a movement of people. And so the concept or the, or the goal of achieving solidarity is so important that everyone is a preservationist in some form or fashion and getting people to uh, embrace that and sit with the, the ugly part of it too, whatever that perception might be you know we're here to, to do that to help to help you do that i think you know as a as a movement i know that you know my colleagues with the action fund they're definitely committed to bringing people you know to that positive realization so a quick story my uh landlady in philadelphia wonderful woman talk to her every month or so now she has these beautiful stone 
uh, properties and she caretakes them. I mean, just meticulously scraping and caring. And, and once I um, just shared with that, that she was a preservation, she said, don't call me that. And I was like, why not? And she just ran off a list of, of, of negative, you know, experiences and perceptions of preservation. And um, I had the good fortune of being able to show her that uh, the love and the care that she takes for her buildings, the, the, the time that she takes with people like me, newbies who moved to town and share about the Philadelphia she grew up in, that she was preserving very important resources, that she was inspiring, you know, with this history. Uh, that she was able to embrace after going through that process, the fact that, okay, I, I think I can accept that now. But again, that takes time um, and relationship building and, and being present and seeing the value, you know, in, in people and their stories. And, and, you know, it takes a community effort at, at the ground, you know, the, the ground level to you know, someone like me who's, you know, now that I'm in the preserve, you know, I've been doing more preservation work and, and I attend the conferences. I, I understand now I get it, in other words, you know. Um, and so I, I always feel when I come back from from, you know, these kinds of conversation, having these conversations or, or conferences, it's my responsibility to go back and just share that knowledge. And, and just as you said, tell people you, you know, you are a preservationist when you tend your garden when you paint your house when you you know uh, fix up your business when you add an ingredient to your grocery store <laughs> because uh, <laughs> that person walked in the door and says i'd like I, I would love it if you could add this thing so you're you're really enriching people's lives by doing that um and so i feel that's my responsibility and and that's why I, I I do proudly call myself a preservationist because I do feel that that is a movement that I I, I want to be part of, um, and and I need to you know kind of start bringing other people together, um, including preservationists. So I, I have a story. I was invited to um, a, a ribbon cutting just two three days ago. They they there was this building that kind of sat at the beginning of a, a Latino neighborhood. Uh, it's called the Broad Street Cultural Corridor. And uh, it sat empty and for about 20 years it had burned and it was a very popular Dominican restaurant that served Caribbean style chicken and those kinds of things. And and those are the stories that I had heard, And and but it sat empty and it, it was right at the, at the gateway, as you call it. Um, and as you went into that neighborhood, that's what it, that, what is what represented the neighborhood. People saw that as what the neighborhood stood for when I knew otherwise. And so the city just bought it and decided to to uh, level it and they redid it and they they built a, a gateway center. So they wanted people to come in and it's right next to our biggest park. It's a zoo. And they want people to find that as a gateway to the zoo. And so they asked me to speak. <laughs> um, and so I I told them the story I shared countless stories i said yes this is a gateway to the zoo but i want to just remind people that this is a gateway to this really wonderful neighborhood and and then i just told stories about what that building was it was a dominic that's similar to what i told you and there was and where you're standing now is is almost sacred we're standing in the location of a, a big one of the first restaurants that was built in the neighborhood and so you know again it's it's that you just have to remind the city and the government officials and even the preservationists who were there that yes now this is a new gateway but let's not forget what stood here before and why it was so important and why it still is important to the community for us not to forget what that was mm -hmm. at one time and what that meant to the neighborhood so we're, bri we're bridges right we, we're standing in the gap right yeah connecting yeah. I just I just thought of an anecdote that I I've, I've got to share this. This was back when I was able to when I was running the diversity scholarship program. And I remember fielding a phone call from a, a fellow Virginian, um, a, a, a white woman who called and asked if it was OK for her to apply for a diversity scholarship. And, you know, I I'd said that yeah but i want to know what is it that you know what is it that you're working on and she told me that she was a part of the she was a descendant of the 
Virginia, Czech, and Slovak communities. I did not know we had <laughs> Czech and Slovak communities in, in Virginia, in the south side of Virginia, uh, south and west of Richmond. And, you know, I was like, I was excited because that was new information. I was like, yes, absolutely. You know, this is, this is good, good, interesting ethnic history, you know, that could add a nice little wrinkle to the South. And as, as we talked, she told me how, you know, her ancestors arrived in Virginia and they saw the Black folks, the formerly enslaved, and they said, hey, they're doing what we did at home. So they felt an immediate bond with the African-American community that they found there in the South Side. Sadly, because as time went on, they took on the, um, they adopted the mores of white Southerners uh, who were there and you saw the break uh, between, a, you know, between communities that had shared values. But the key point, the key reason I bring this up is that after she had her successful run, you know, as a diversity scholar at the conference and, um, you know, met wonderful sets of folks and made, you know, made all the, did all the networking that she could. She sent me a letter the following year, all excited saying that, you know, she um, wrote a letter to the mayor of her, of her town, I think it was Petersburg, Virginia, uh, stating that she was, you know, writing in support of an effort to save an African-American historic place. And she wrote very clearly as a diversity scholar, as a former diversity scholar for the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And I was thrilled because she understood, she understood her role. She understood the opportunity that she, you know, she was like, okay, I have some privilege. Let me go ahead, you know, with my white woman self and, you know, show support for, you know, for fellow folks who are in the fight to preserve community and culture. And, and that still sits with me to this moment because it felt in that, in that sense, I was like, that's what I meant when I'd said that if I did this right with the diversity scholarship program, if I could get white folks to see themselves as diverse as well, then I will have done something because I know the rest of us see it, but do they see themselves in their various iterations of Europe you know, out there doing their thing. And then to turn around and use that, that sense of, that gained sense of, you know, that newness of, you know, I can do this too. I'm a part of this broader community. And then use that to be supportive of other efforts. Yes, that, that felt like that, preser that was a preservation moment for me. You know, and I, I hope I've not spoken to that woman since I left the trust back in, back in 2008, but I hope that she's continuing to do that, I, it'd be great if she were somehow in this space right now going, oh my God, Free, I can't believe you remember <laughs> that story. But that, that to me was my sort of great example of, of a person who was worried about whether or not she could be in a space and then found herself taking advantage of being an ally after the fact, which I thought was great. Wonderful, thank you so much for that for sharing. The goal is, is solidarity, right? To stand is. in solidarity and to as, see that we are more alike than we're different. You know, uh, Felicia Rashad, who is co-chair of the um, African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund and um, our brand ambassador, I'm going to paraphrase, but she has a wonderful quote where she um, encourages, encourages us to see the humanity in each other. That's, that's when we can go and grow towards solidarity, when we understand our shared humanity and our shared history. Again, Black history is American history. And, uh, you know, Latino history here in this country is thing, American uh, history. With, um, so um, just wanted to then kind of talk a little bit about <laughs> our role as preservation and practitioners. You know, you know how that thing um, came up. And I bringing... Done. Uh, people to that point, bringing people to the solidarity. What what do you guys think? You know, are our roles? I used the term bridge earlier, standing in the gap to kind of um, share information. But what what do you all see as our roles as practitioners and and those who are coming to this conference are hoping to grow their skills as well and take them back um, back to their respective home hometown. So let's can we chop it up a little bit about our roles? Uh, in the movement and when we're interacting in our communities? 
Well, bridges is one thing, and I I don't necessarily mean to say this because I'm in that age bracket, but we need to act like elders. <laughs> we we need to, you know, we we know our we know our field. We know, you know, I I can speak from one perspective of preservation, and the three the three of us together can come together and define it in different ways, but it's still the same thing, right? We all have the different perspective. But, you know, I, I believe in education, you know, being an educator. Um, I use I do use the word elder because I don't know, somehow I think the word elder is has a little bit more respect to it. Um, I try to put respect to it. I teach kids that just because you're you use the word elder doesn't mean that you have white hair and you're you're don't know what you're talking about. But you're an elder because you're wise. You you know what you know, you've been there. Um, and you're all, you're an elder, an elder because you want to learn. It's not just that you have all the answers. It's just that we need to come together to learn from each other. Um, so in the preservation world, that's how I, I see it. I, I'm really trying to, to bring as part of the allyship, a lot of young people who don't really look or understand or want, want to, don't care about the preservate, the word, word preservation or, or the preservation field or don't understand it. So. You know that that's kind of what I'm trying to add to my list of uh, things to ways to look at at um, being an ally. Well, what about in, you, in my, Melissa? In my experience, you know, you know, had to be a little bit of everything. Yeah, you know, coming in and and helping to interpret the language that we've developed in this movement that we've developed in this profession. You know, it's a lot of you know verbs, terms, you know, we have a very large lexicon of terms that really, you know, uh, confuse and confound. Um, some people say we did it for that purpose, but uh, nonetheless, um, so come in as an interpreter, um, uh, try to come in um, to uh, facilitate uh, and get people in the room so that uh, we can exchange, so that they can uh, constituents can share their lived experience uh, and allow, whether it be allies or elected officials or whomever, the opportunity to value that, to hear it, to see it embodied in a person, in another human being, and, and come to value that. Um, yeah, and then also come in as, for lack of a better you know term, a bit of a gadfly, um, especially when dealing with governments, institutions, organizations who've always done things a certain way and always had a certain perspective and just pose those questions um, to hopefully get them to open uh, their understanding and, and open their minds to uh, most importantly, valuing uh, a community, valuing the resources within that community, and, and again, um, planning at the speed of trust. Um, because as, as quiet as it's kept, we're, we're all in this boat together. I don't care what corner you've assigned yourself to. Uh, I don't care how much you've worked to separate yourself, whether it's in gated communities or, you know, restricted districts or whatever, we're all still in this boat together. Uh, and, um, so in, as a preservationist, I see my role as pulling up the shade and shedding some light on the fact that we're not, that we're not separate rather, that we are together. And um, you, you can't throw that boomerang without it coming back. So let's make sure we're putting out good work and that we're being uh, as equitable as we can be and that we are valuing and lifting up each other. Uh, because when, I'm lift, when I lift you up, I'm lifted up as well. So that's how I see, you know, some of my roles. How about you, Free? I I usually say that I try to meet people where they are and and figure out what is it that I can do to help other individuals see that what I'm doing is akin to what they do, but they may not necessarily see it the same way. So that if you're a sports fan and you have a, a revered uh, stadium or field that is in the process of being restored, you know, I'm like, you're, you're like me. 
you're you're in the preservation game because you know you know that you know the stories that you have attached to that place and you want to see that place you know restored so that you can go back and continue to share with others that which you've gained gain there um for me also i i've been very big on music venues of late thinking the same thing if you're a fan you had that special concert where you you met someone or you know you had that first love your first musical love and you know you got to see them and you know when you hear a song you see yourself back in that concert getting your groove on you know when that place is threatened you, you know, I want people to tap into those, those old feelings and go, yeah, that place should be saved because, you know, yeah, that story was, you, you had a good story about what you did there, you know, back in 1987 or something like that. And, you know, the effort that the folks here are, are putting towards saving this place, you know, is a part of respecting and honoring that memory that you have. You know, so you're a preservationist because you know you want to see that place saved too, and it's it is it it is that sense of respect. It is that sense of again meeting people where they are, but getting them to understand that the work that we all do is in a way helping to honor the memories that they have for various aspects of their lives, no matter who it is that you are. You know, and and there's a beauty to that because in getting them to understand and see, you know, see that aspect of themselves, we then get allies when it comes time to go to a city council, a state legislature, a governor's office, the federal government, you know, now we've got a whole group of people behind us who are like, yeah, 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 we, we, we want to support what it is that they're doing because, you know, they've helped us, they've helped to remind us of why it is that you know we're supporting them doing their work, you know, and and that's how I see this opportunity of of expanding, you know, our movement, moving us, you know, again back to my my constant line, moving us back to that history, whether it's a personal history, whether it's a learned history, whether it's an acquired history, you know, it goes back to that. You know, why are we here? Why are we doing this? And we all know why. You know, we're we're trying to preserve that history in some way, shape, or form, and that's that's how I see the the role that I have, and and I, I accept that you know as a as an academic historian, that's kind of where my head sits. I'm always I'm always fascinated by what I learn when I go someplace. You know, I get to a place and I'm like, tell me what happened there again, and I'm trying to put it in the historic broader historical context of some other stuff that I've learned or you know my my areas of expertise. You know, and, and that's how I do them. always thinking about historic sites and how, you know, they can use, um, they can work with academic institutions and get grad students or undergraduate students to help build their sites capacity by helping them improve the historical interpretations that they have. You know, that's, that's how my mind works, you know, in terms of, of my approach to bring the, the, the particular gifts that I have, you know, in this field. Uh, forward, but I also, as a former director for diversity at the trust, you know, I'm, I'm I'm constantly thinking about the many multiplicity of groups that exist here, and our interrelationships, and and really, you know, trying to figure out ways that we can all do a better job of making sure that the totality of the complex history of this country, you know, gets to be told. And that the places that we can save can be saved so that those stories can continue to be told for future generations. I love how we're all using the word stories. <laughs> I love that. Being an oral historian, that's really, that's really how, you know, I do my work. I, I, I base, every, you know, I, to me, the stories are so important. The stories of a, I mean, you, each of you have shared stories, you know, yeah. um, the stories of, you know, the first time you went to a, a concert, the story, the first time you tasted something that reminded you of back home. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering, I, I'm not, I don't do preservation work, you know, by definition, but I'm just wondering, do you, how much do you depend on stories to make decisions? Is, are the, is it at the top three of your list or is it top 10? Is it like personal stories, oral histories? Or just stories. 
Definitely. I mean, oh yeah, <laughs> without think about, a doubt. You know, best practices when it comes to documentation. That's the first thing you want to know is what is what happened. Like you said, free. What happened here? Yeah. So we can start documenting and then go to documents, documentation to further confirm yep. um, the 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 um, uh, how it can be applied across so many communities and and how it touches so many lives and and so many of us. You know, as you begin your process, whether it's for designation, whether it's for advocacy work to save or promote that space, or even uh, knowing the story so you can motivate and educate the young folks and, and bring them into the fold, get them excited about this story and what happened in this place and and um, active in, you know, preserving it and, and, and reactivating it if it's not already in use. So yeah, it's it's top of the list. Yeah. And I was going to say that, oh, I'm sorry, the, the, no, national, go ahead. I asked the, the national, question. The national register nominations that I've, I've worked on that have been successful have incorporated, I've incorporated oral history, oral history interviews in those, and with the specific goal of trying to find the oldest person who is related to the historic place, and a younger person, but the oldest person related to an historic place because that person can tell me, you know, can get me as far back as possible. But I often also look for a younger person who I see as, you know, I want to know, are you gonna be that steward going forward? As the older generation leaves us, those places need stewards. And by doing that, that's, that's how I try to construct my way of putting together oral histories to support a nomination for the National Register of Historic Places. Yeah, I love that that moment when you have a, a, a you know an elder and a young person together, and 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 you know you could almost see that knowledge being passed through when again that bulb goes off. Um, and and you know and I have found when I I do end up going to try to meet with state legislators or even federal legislators. It's those personal stories that they want to hear. You can come in with all kinds of data and you can come in with, you know, reports, but it's like, okay, do you have any story? I mean, it's the stories that really sometimes sway the decision or, or, or weigh very heavily. Um, and it's from the young people. It's from the young people. So yeah, especially, con especially constituent stories. Especially. That's, that's always the key. You need yes. to make sure that they're their constituents so that you're reminding them that these are people who who can vote for you, <laughs> you know, you know this is important. Or it could yeah. be, the, or they could be the next elected official that you absolutely <laughs> making these decisions. However, I have to point out that you know, since we are here at the Pass Forward Conference, that a lot of our um, colleagues here are looking for those best practices when you are dealing with these intangible resources that are our stories. And so as, as our oral historian here, Marta, any kind of best practices, you know, for someone who says, okay, so oral history is a tool, what do I need to make sure to do or not to do when collecting these very important, but, but sensitive and intangible resources? Yeah, I do a lot of fact checking. So I also have a journalism background and I, I, I approach oral histories. I, it, to me, it's just, it's just important to capture story from somebody who has one to share, but also I, I, I use the, you know, I need to verify it three times, you know, make sure that three people have the same, at, you know, again, it could be more than three people, but three people, once the third person verifies that same fact. So it's up, you have to do fact, fact checking. And then, you know, I do go to the archives. Archives are important. Um, reading newspaper articles sometimes. Uh, so really just making sure that that you do your your detective work and the facts are there together it's not i mean the three of us can be at the same event and we each have a whole different story to tell mm -hmm. so you have to have factual checks all the time that's that's the best practice advice i always give mm -hmm. what about you free As everyone everyone has to be a little bit of an historian you have to be because again, you know, like with the journalism aspect, you're you're required to get, you know, if you're doing an oral history for me, you know, I'm making sure that if the goal is to get a designation, that I am I'm making sure that not only am I making sure that the interviewees are conveying the historic importance of the place, 
but that they are that they are more or less as, as Marta said they're they are they're bolstering the information that I know I, I always walk into an oyster interview knowing the basic the straight up history mm -hmm. of the space so when they're talking to me I'm looking for you know key things that I know about the historic relevance of a place if a civil rights event yeah. happened in that space and I hear somebody say that I already knew that that civil rights event happened but I now have a witness to that right. you know that's you know, again, I'm simply repeating what Marta said, but it's it for me. It's it's not journalism. It's it's the academic history training for me. So yeah, I am I am running to an archive. I am I'm digging through newspapers, but I love those things. You know, I'm sure. a nerd like I'm a history nerd like that. So. Well, I have to always uh, do the disclaimer that I am not a historian. You know, uh, you know. You know, I'm a busybody who likes to you know get people hyped up and get them working on something that elevates and motivates and inspires all of us. Like and, historians and, are busybodies? No. Oh. Who published what they That's, learned? <laughs> well, as, but as, you know, a best practice, now I'm kind of, uh, uh, it motivates to remind folks to get both sides, go cross the tracks yeah. and get both sides or as many sides of the story as you possibly can. You made a great point, Marta. We can all three yeah. be in the same place and have a totally different experience and perspective. And so with oral histories, if you are focused on African-American story, go, go to you know the, the, the white residents or neighbors, Asian, Latin, go check out everyone's perspective on it to really give us that full story. You know, as we say at the Action Fund, telling the full story. So um, that, that's the one thing that I will add in terms of a best practice and check out the, you know, the oral history entity or organization in your county or your town or your state um, to get other uh, to do's in terms of, you know, permission releases and, and other uh, ways to ask questions and, and to collect the data because those, those are some really important resources uh, to utilize. But I think we're coming up on our time. Um, so we, we can't leave without talking about moving from vision to action, since that's our theme uh, here at Pass Forward this year. Um, so how do we, you know, we've gotten people, you know, envisioning this world as one our, and this movement as one of solidarity and, and unity. How do, how do we move from that vision? Uh, or the vision that you even have for preservation? How do we move to action? What's what's our call? What what do we do next? Yeah, I think that's a key word. Move. Just keep keep your feet on the ground. Um, you know, talk to as many people. Just you know, grass. Just for me, it's to 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 continue the grassroots movement. Um, work with young people. You know, the, the going back to the the role model elder teacher, educator, and just start, um, you know, one of the things that I have found in, there's only one, there's one uh, university here in Rhode Island that has a preservation, uh, focuses on preservation, and they're very, very few. I don't even, I, I dare say there are no people of color in that field right now. And so for me, that's my goal is just to try to get some of the young people as young as middle school to start understanding. And for me, it's through the understanding of the cultural preservation approach. You know, what you are doing is you are a preservationist when you, you know, look at it that way. So, so yeah, that's my, my call is to, to, to work with young people and get them to understand a, a, a more holistic way of looking at, at the preservation world so that you don't get the misunderstandings and the and the doubts that you did, Melissa, when you talked to your neighbor about the fact that she was fixing her house. She was already, she had this frame of mind and said, oh no, no, preservationists are bad people. So we need to start young and start changing that attitude. You're muted, Melissa. I was gonna say, how about you, Free? What how do we move in from I'll, vision to action? I'll 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 keep I'll keep this uh I'll keep it as quickly as, as quick as I can. I would I would challenge everybody who is listening to our conversation. If there's a particular project that you're working on 
and you're not focused and you've not taken a somewhat deeper dive on the actual history of that place or the history related to that specific project, do that. And if you do that, see if you find that you have new questions coming up that actually can help make it so that you're doing a better, a better job at doing the professional work that you're doing. Because I, I would guarantee you that there's, there may be something that you might be overlooking that the history of that particular place is trying to tell you, but you haven't seen it yet. That's, that would be my challenge to, as an historian, to others who are, who are watching me. Do that, do a deeper dive on the project that you're working on right now, historically speaking, and see if you have any new questions come up. And if you do, run with it. Wow, I like it, very motivating. Hard, hard one to follow as we wrap. Um, well, I concur with, with what both of you have shared. You know, keep, keep moving and um, you know, dig deeper and check your intention, check your motivation. Um, because if it is to an uplift and to inspire uh, and to tell the fuller story, there's no challenge with questions. There's no challenge with um, criticism. It's an opportunity to learn. And so as we celebrate our fifth anniversary you know, of the African-American Cultural Heritage Action Fund, I, I just wanna offer to yay, uh, all of um, our colleagues, practitioners, grassroots, whomever, um, just take the first step, call whomever you think might be able to help add to this vision that you have. That, um, don't, don't hesitate to check in with the action fund. I mean, I remember listening to Brent Legs, our executive director gush about this vision that he had about this very thing that has been in existence for five years now, that has uh, supported more than 200 projects around the nation and raised $80 million. Uh, just on this, this determination uh, to move this vision forward. So I, again, I just can't say enough. Happy anniversary, um, Action Fund, for being a light, for being a beacon, an example. Thank you all for being here. And like Marta said, just keep moving. Just keep your feet on the ground with your head to the sky and let your intention to uplift move you forward. And do the work. Um, do the work. Thank you all so much. This has been great. Thank you. Mm -hmm.